work and happiness. <laughs> So help you understand how small scale production works. It's definitely different than large scale production. Um, I think it's like 51% of the world's food is actually produced through small scale producers because they're the, the quantity of them versus the number of large scale producers that we have in Canada and the United States, Russia. So it is important to understand small scale production and some of the challenges related to small scale production. So. Canada's economy is shaped like a diamond and Ghana's economy is shaped like a triangle. Does anyone know, except Delor because he works in economics? Uh, does anyone, and maybe Ed it will be exempt from this exercise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, what makes a developed, uh, a developed country, um, a developed country, one of the aspects, is that the majority of people sit right here in the, there's a large middle class and a large middle class essentially helps to keep your economy really stable. In Ghana, it's, there's a large percentage of people that live uh, in, in a poverty situation or close to the poverty line, and then there's very few people that are wealthy. So it's just a good way to think about, um, it's very simplistic, but it's, it's a good way to understand the difference between <coughs> a developing country and a developed country. That middle class is very important to keeping an economy. And Ghana's middle class is growing, which is what makes Ghana, you know, right? Yeah, Ghana. It was, you know. Yeah, it was. Ghana did have a. They had shifted from developing country to middle income status, right? And uh, so they're at middle income status, and um, I'm not sure right now where that sits. Maybe do you wanna speak to that? Our status now is a lower middle income country. Yeah. So they they have definitely shifted um, uh, to more. I mean, there's not really a shape for that, but you can maybe imagine that this is starting to be a little bit thicker around here. So they are moving their their status up. So how it goes is it goes developing country and then middle income country and developed. So they're sitting at that kind of lower middle income. And what it means is that generally speaking is that people make a certain percent or a certain amount per. So, oh, you cannot see that at all, but um, the economic profile of Ghana in 2014 was the GDP was 38.65 billion. Uh, GDP growth was 4.2%. Inflation, however, is up 15.5%, um, which is, um, for a while, the inflation rate was, a, was under control. The average income is $1,600 per person per year. So, um, I think we were talking yesterday, that's uh, U.S. Canadian-wise, that's about equivalent to $22,000 uh, per year, so it's still not tons of money. Um, it's a uh, gateway to West Africa, so Ghana is, I know that sometimes people ask a lot about security concerns, Ghana is a peaceful country and I think Ghanaians are very protective of the fact that they're a peaceful country. So, um, you can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no, like, the country hasn't struggled with civil war. Uh, they don't really struggle with a lot of conflicts. Um, Ghanaians are very proud of the fact that they've had peaceful elections, and that's definitely not always the case. So, um, in two, was it 2000 or eight? 2012. 2012, it was quite peaceful. And what was the election where it was very close and the guy still was? Professor Mills' election. That's 2008. 2008. Yeah. 
so what happened in 2008 is the election was extremely close. Very close, yeah. And so instead of, which can often happen in sub-Saharan African countries, instead of there being a re-election or, or the guy challenging it or saying it wasn't real, he handed over the election he, and said, um, even though it's close, I'm not challenging it. And that was a huge victory for Ghana, I think, because um, it really demonstrated that uh, Ghana was committed to the democratic process and and to, to fair elections. So I think that uh, really shows a lot of leadership for Ghana. At first, it seems as if slave marketing place. After they stop the slavery, they turn it as a prison. So this is where our first Prime Minister was kept. That's in Kuma. He was kept inside there for two years before he became a Prime Minister of Ghana for the first time. In 1950s. So inside over there, we have a gate of no return, a female prison, a slave marketing place, and a female prison. As you go, Chris. The land is free. Yeah. The house. So early morning, six o'clock, I have to go around to pick them up to the school. When you don't do that, they will not come by themselves. Because oh. the parents are fishermen. Yeah. So I do the volunteer work eight years now. And then now the fishermen can understand exactly what the petition is. That is very important for the kids to read the rights. And do they have to rent a space or anybody can put their Everybody fish? can put the fish because those are the MP, the former MP, Fanda Oh, the Dutch name. The Dutch name is what? The fish market. Wonderful. Every morning at 6 in the morning. So, this is a proper farm. And the plant population is 300. You, you have to nurse the seeds for eight weeks before you transplant. And it takes six months to mature. And we, we had a very bad weather this year. So you can see we can, we, a lot of them are dying out now. So what we have to do is that we fill it in again. They do, they develop the technology, right? And when they develop the technology, they give it to the Ministry of Agriculture. Then the Ministry of Agriculture will do the implementation through their district agents. So, um, last year, they gave us close to 
6,000 sticks to plant. So when it's generated, what they did was they would take the fruit, they would take the fruit and then give the sticks to us. And then we can also give some to our other farmers so we can um, expand the variety. So this one, after one year, you can use it for curry or starch. And it is called Ampo. So they name it after the person who discovered the, the technology. When we harvest the maize. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, this is the this is where you would store like maize or cassava once it's harvested, so that it can grow away from like rodents or snakes or anything like that. God will bless you wherever you are. Well, um, beyond that, um, I have a passion for whatever I do. And um, I always want to do whatever I'm doing very well. And I think that's about it all. Um, I also like money. So whatever I do must bring income. So what it takes to get that thing giving me income is what I do. I started, I used to work with the ministry um, under a project called Dapit Project. And uh, we're actually introducing alternatives. Can you please give revenue. us the full meaning of DAPIT? DAPIT, DAPIT yes, is an acronym that means um, Development and Application of Intermediate Technology. It was an agency set up in the Ministry of Science and Technology to disseminate research findings on agriculture from the CSR. You know, because at that time, um, most of this research were lying on the shelves. So the DAPIT as an agency was to do the dissemination of this uh, technology for the so, yeah to the rural communities yeah. basically so i happen to be part of the team and then we're teaching rabbits we're teaching grass cutters snails um, um mushroom. beekeeping and mushroom and um, one of our successful projects was in uh, ofinsu in ashanti region there was a guy i trained in rabbits um he started small um after two years of operation you know he invited me to ofinsu to see what is done with rabbits, and it was very impressive. Um, I spent the weekend with him, and uh, he came to see me off at the Glory Park, you know, where I bought the truck back to Accra, and he gave me a transport fare. He paid my transport. Those days, um, 500,000 cities was huge money. I'm talking about uh, 97, 98. It was big money. And you know what he said? Mr. Brown, you keep on teaching people rabbit and grass cutters. You don't go and do it. Uh, we always give you money to chop. <laughs> he just told me that. So, uh, this guy is, is telling me something. So later on, you know, long and short of it, I decided to leave the ministry because um, after going around, those who took the project seriously were doing very well and their lives were changing. So I said, oh, why do I keep saying yes sir, yes sir to my boss every time? I want to leave this sector. So in 2000, I just one day I just wrote my resignation and I left. When I came out, I decided to go through the meal because uh, the package we gave every farmer was three female rabbits and a male as a startup. And I started, I made my own hatch, um, fed them around and uh, by the end of my first year, I was already producing a hundred rabbits a month. My initial cost was um, thousand cities you know those days we had not gone into the new currencies uh, now this is I think when you look at the video you see this thing the, the, the farm channel video we had this thing on the left and right but now the, um, we've been able to increase our capacity by 50% so we're doing new designs now so when you look at the other side the, the, the hatches are now different we're now having a two tier okay now so we have increased our capacity by 50% on the farm and then also in the outdoor scheme. So we have more young farmers producing rabbits from the backyard and we are mobilizing all of that. So it's and we, we've also specialized only on meat breeds. Our focus is rabbit meat production. So we're focusing on meat sales. So we're using the best breeds for meat production. We're adopting the best practices for meat. So as far as meat production and consumption is concerned.
Imagine you know, Papa.